I'm David Kirby. I'm the Robert O. Lawton Distinguished Professor of Poetry at Florida State University. And I'm a poet and I teach all kinds of things and read all kinds of things. And actually I write about a lot of different things, but uh, poetry pays the bills at our house, yeah. I, I don't know. Uh, I, I, I think I was interested in it when I became interested in uh, like trees and birds and flowing streams and nursery rhymes. I mean, uh, what I remember is, is, um, is writing and making up things when I was a little kid. Those were my first memories. I was, I was the, uh, the younger of, of uh, two. And then of course my, my parents were, you know, parent age. And actually they had me, uh, I was, they were in their forties when they had me. So um, uh, the, the other three people that I lived with were, uh, you know, big, big and, uh, you know, in, in many ways, uh, uh, you know, taking care of their own needs. So I was, I, I think I became a kind of a little entertainer and, and made up things uh, so that I would get their attention. Uh, and uh, the, the poetry flowed out of that. Uh, it can be a fine line, can't it? Yeah, uh, you know, the, well, the, the first, first thing I always want to say is pleasure first. You know, it has to, it has to give me pleasure. I mean, there's so many elements uh, to, a, to a poem, you know, emotional, spiritual, intellectual, psychological. But um, I, I read four poems every morning on my phone. I just reach over my bedside table and pick it up. And, and there um, are the, uh, the poems from different services. And, uh, you know, a lot of them leave me pretty, uh, uh, pretty blah. But uh, the, the ones that really get to me uh, often get to me for very different reasons. Uh, I th a poem has to have a certain complexity to it uh, b because life is, you know, simple on, on, on the surface of things. So I'm looking for something that's more complex besides, you know, floss your teeth, stop at the stop sign, love your mom, that kind of stuff. Uh, but then it's, it's got to be clear as well. Uh, the, the poem, uh, it, it beckons me forward, asks me to do a little bit of work. Uh, but not so much that I'm, uh, I'm put off, but, uh, you know, it, it beckons me in, um, uh, you know, pretty soon I'm enjoying myself, getting that pleasure, seeing some clarity. And then it's, you know, it's, uh, you know, I was, Antonio, I was going to say uh, it needs to be well made, but I'm, I'm not really sure what that means anymore. The more, more I read poetry, uh, you know, the more open I am, it seems to different formats. And and, uh, and 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 different voices. Uh, you know, sometimes people say, to me, "Well, I don't I don't get poetry," and I say, "Well, that's you know that's like saying I don't get weather." You know, uh, it's, you know, they're just so many different kinds. And you know what what they're saying is that you know they don't read poetry or don't know anything about it, have have had no exposure to it. So um, yeah, uh, it's you know it can be anything under the sun. As, as long as, first of all, it pleases me and then it engages me uh, on an intellectual level and, and moves toward clarity. I mean, it doesn't have to be clear right off. You know, T.S. Eliot said a poem uh, is, is, uh, is, is grasped, is apprehended, uh, you know, often long before we understand it. And that, that's fine by me. You know, in, in many ways, a poem is like looking uh, it's less like reading an essay or an article in the newspaper, more like looking at a, uh, at a dancer or, or, or looking at a painting. I mean, you know, our, as consumers of art, we're, we're all pretty much operating on the kindergarten level, you know, which is, you know, you start out by saying, I like it or I don't. I feel that the most important thing to be a poet is you have to have the mind of a poet and, and reading is part of that. But more of it is just is just being constantly alive. More, more of it is just being every having everything turned on and being completely open to the world and being non censorious. I mean, you can't you can't say that anything is wrong or that anything is not not working uh, as as a poem. Uh, you know, you just have to you just have to dig it all, and uh, you have to be a magpie. You know, you have to go in and, and and pick up everything. You know, the magpie picks up. Uh, you know, a zircon picks up a shiny pebble. If a diamond falls out of his, uh, somebody's engagement ring, the, the magpie will pick up that. The magpie will pick up the, uh, the tab to a, 
to a beer can. Um, you know, the, it, he's completely uh, non-discriminatory and then goes back to his nest and makes a magpie nest out of it, I guess. Uh, but that, you know, that, that's the most important thing is just to have that total openness. So I encourage my students, you know, to, to keep what I call a bits journal or where you just, you, you write down everything all the time and you never, never, never say that's not going to work in your form or that's not a good topic. You know, you just, you just write it down and, uh, and then you go back and you look at it and you say, okay, if I, if I take this here and I move it over there and I, you know, write something that threads the two together, uh, you know, and often when I write something that threads the two together, what I've written is better than, than either one. You just, you know, you, you work that way. You, you stay, you know, stay on your toes, stay light, you know, float like a butterfly, sting like a bee. I was back in, as actually uh, in uh, 1969, I've been here that long. And uh, I had a bunch of, bunch of different uh, offers. I was born and raised on a farm in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And uh, I thought, well, I've, you know, I lived there the first 21 years of my life. And I thought, well, I've done, done, done the South. So I'm not going not gonna to live in the South anymore. So my, my job offers were from uh, Texas, two in Florida, uh, uh, one in Georgia, and, uh, and one in Virginia. So I thought, okay, all right, I'm, I'm destined to come back to the South. And you know, I just talked to some smart people and they said, FSU is the one, F FSU is where you want to go. And boy, am I glad I listened to those guys. I read so many of these interviews and everybody's always got a theme uh, and that's fine. Good for them. Uh, 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 you know, they're, they're writing about identity or they're, they're writing about, uh, you know, politics or something like that. And um, I don't really work that way. And I think that's why I don't really have trouble writing poetry and, uh, and, and why, it, you know, I've written, you know, I've published too many books, probably. I have a uh, if I sat on a stack of them, you know, you wouldn't even see me in this photo. But, uh, you know, the, this, this stuff comes out. Why? Because, uh, you know, because of that openness I mentioned earlier and, the, and that magpie-like uh, love of little, you know, nuggets of, of things that are shiny. Well, uh, th this poem, you'll, you'll see it has, it's going to have a theme, um, but... I worked my way to the theme. I didn't know where I was going. I didn't know where I was going. You know, the novelist E.L. Doctorow says, uh, you can drive from here, uh, you know, you, when you're driving at night uh, on a dark road, you can only see, uh, you know, 100 yards ahead. They said, but you can drive from here to Buffalo that way. You know, you don't have to see Buffalo in the distance. You know, you just take it a link at a time. So, you know, I, I kind of do that and head, head toward my uh, theme that way. Now let me set this poem up a little bit. The name of it is simply Van Gogh, after the artist. Uh, and for a couple of years I've been thinking, boy, I need to write something about Van Gogh. He's a pretty, pretty interesting guy. But uh, I, uh, I, I had a colleague who uh, um, lost a family member and uh you can you can imagine what that was like and uh i was talking to her once at a gathering and and uh somebody came up and said simply how was your summer and you know i kind of reared back and gosh what is she going to say and the person said uh well we had our ups and downs and uh and uh you know the person the other person said, well, I hope you had more ups than downs. And, you know, the, the conversation kind of went on. So, you know, the, 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 the grieving person salvaged this, this uh, sad moment. So, you know, I was, I was really impressed with that, that you know, subtle and use of language. So I had that in mind. And then I read uh, an article in the New York Times uh, about, it was an essay by a guy whose daughter, uh, two-year-old daughter died. She was uh, out with her grandma and it was a freak accident. A cornice fell off a building and a piece of, piece of marble hit her in the head and she died. And uh, so, uh, you know, you can't, you don't have to have young kids yourself to 
think, gosh, you know, what, what would that, how devastating could that be? Nothing could be more, you know, more ruinous uh, to you. So I had that in mind too. And uh, so these, these are big problems, right? You know, and, but you can't write a poem that says, oh, death is terrible and uh, uh, we can't get over it. So uh, I, I just began to put words on a page and, uh, and, and poke them around. And I changed the circumstances of, of everything because you don't want to write about somebody's own life. Uh, but uh, I made the accident a bike accident rather than uh, something falling. And then uh, at some point I realized Van Gogh is my is myself. I say, how was your summer? And you say, we had our ups and downs. And I say, well, I hope it was more ups than downs. And you pause for a moment and then you say, Liam died. And before I can bite my tongue off, you tell me about the bike, the stop sign, the distracted driver, the call to you, the call from you to your wife, your parents, hers, the service, the stunned look on the faces of Liam's friends, the look the grown-ups gave you, the sense you got that they too were devastated, yet felt lucky and guilty about their luck. I let you talk, though as I did, I imagined you getting the call and looking around and realizing that you were seeing the world for the last time as you had known it. And then you called the others. Van Gogh said he saw things as if in a dream, as themselves, yet at the same time stranger than reality. On the last day of his life, he shouldered his bag of brushes and paints and canvases and made his way to the wheat field where the crows cooed and cawed and rattled and clicked, unable to believe their luck. 